positively I identify yourself for that contract, yeah. and you have to be able to be identified. Exactly. Right? Otherwise, that's bad faith as well. Right. But as long as I don't do so with fraudulent or, or intent. Malice, uh, I can call myself it all comes down to intent. We're going to expand on all this afterwards. I was told the philosophy we don't is supposed to be uh, that a name is defined by Webster's as, as that which a object or a thing is known, and a definition of word is a speech sound or series of speech sounds. So how can you identify as a speech sound? How can you live in a speech sound? How can you do anything as a speech sound? You need to be addressed to something. Absolutely. I mean, I... Plus, the, is, the argument was that um, yeah. you, your role in the courtroom is more important than the name. Of yeah. So well, so, so, so this is where I'll get on to why, it's actually, why people got to stop. The same way that people have to stop fearing, you know, uh, the government finding out who you are. Like, I don't care. My name's on a whiteboard. They know where I live. Believe me, you guys have seen my paperwork. If they don't know where I live to come and get me or shoot me or throw me in jail, then they're never going to find out, right? You've got to stop fearing them, right? And in order to stop fearing them, you've got to stop fearing this name as well. And I'm going to get into the reason why, because you can actually turn it around to your advantage at that point. And that's what we're going to get into, uh, which is the biggest point of everything I'm ever going to make, and that might even have to wait for other days, is, is the issue of liability. You don't care what name they're calling you. I don't care what name they're calling me. It all comes down to liability. Who's assuming liability for the claims being made, right? And then we get into the other forms of law, which is the contract. Where's the contract? You know, who's compelling me to perform in this contract? I don't care what you're calling me, but you but you got to provide the evidence that I've been compelled to perform in this name in a, in a contract somewhere. Call me whatever you want, really, because ultimately my name is just three letters long, man. Anything after that is just a construct. It's a fiction. Everything after that is a fiction. Whether it's the all cap, whether it's Dean, all capital Dean, all capital only Clifford, those are all constructs. They're just different versions of me for different purposes. And we can't be scared of any of them. We just got to learn how to master them all, which we can do because we're men. We're full of limited liability. You know, we, we create our own destinies. We do whatever we want. We take control of things. We're full liability. And you got to learn to actually just to start to, to pilot this stuff and use it, and say, yeah, yeah, you got, you got that, yeah, you got it right. That's me. What's it to you, right? Instead of no, no, you know what? No, that's that's not that's not my name. I, I'm not I'm not a I'm not a person, right? So you can use the, the the legal. You can use the argument. Well, do you want the legal person or do you want the man, right? The only reason that works is because what you've done now is you've differentiated the fact that there is a difference between the two names. That also, but even that could be, well, you know, you're all just one, one same party. But the, the, the whole point is, is once you, once you basically separate the, idea, the, separate the name, so now there's, you know, you've separated this, this name from that name. Now there's two of us. And they only want that name. And that name is now floating out there because you're saying, well, I'm over here, I'm the man, and uh, the legal name is right here. You're not... You're distancing yourself from it, but you're not denying that it's you in some capacity because you can still act in that capacity. And that's why you've heard people go to court and make the argument, well, you know, which capacity do you want me here in? Do you want me here in the capacity of the man or do you want me here in the capacity of the driver? <coughs> According to the Highway Traffic Act, do you want me here in the capacity of this, capacity of that? Capacity, you know, I could be anything you want me to be. Which hat do you want me to wear? Me to wear? Exactly. Because that's all that name is, is it's a presumption, it's just a broad, it's just something, just to get you there. And then hoping you're not going to know how to make the proper, um, not arguments, but, but navigate yourself through the court properly. And that is, well, what, what, what binds me to that? You know, you guys are calling me this, um, what is that bound to? Where's the contract? What obligations am I bound to perform in that? Did I agree to it? Was there valuable consideration? What was I supposed to perform? Was I aware of all the, yeah, and that's the rules of contract. Then we get into that kind of stuff, right? So you've got to be able to know how to, to get into that kind of stuff. And we'll get into all that kind of stuff later, but then there's, you know, the talking to the judges and the judges ordering around, ordering the sheriffs and stuff like that. That's all. But the big problem was we wanted to address what the name was. And I don't even tackle the problem of, of, of trying to come up with what that name is because, again, that's all it is. It's a presumption. It's a presumption that you are that as presumption, there's a contractual obligation. It's a presumption that you're operating in some capacity, and then you just have to dismantle the presumption at that point. 
because that's what the courts operate on is presumptions, right? So uh, to go further from there, I guess, uh, actually I didn't really have much of a way, uh, much in the way of a, a template to work on tonight with this, but um, okay, where to go from there would be why we're in the problem we're in. And I was speaking with people about this a couple of years ago and it finally sank in about a year and a half ago when we got into the whole trust law issue and why, and the different law forms. And why trust law? Because you've got all these, these different levels of, of, of law um, that just have different authorities, different jurisdictions, and different levels of force. Um, and you've got obviously statutory law, which is the lowest inferior form of law there is on the planet, right? It's like, uh, it's public servant codes is what I call it, right? If you're a trash collector, it's just, well, it's regular, well, there's regulations in all sorts of different forms of law, but statutory law itself is the lowest form of law. So it's, yeah. Why do they, well, yeah, why do they, well, why do they call it public, well, that's, that's any form of law, but why do they call them public servants, right? They're servants, they're, those are the slaves of society, right? They're supposed to serve everybody. They're the public servants. So statutes are actually public servant codes. It's criminal code of Canada. It only applies to people that work for the government, agents of government, and they're all public servants. If you make the argument that, for instance, Her Majesty is a public servant. She's not. Okay. Which, well, hang on. We, we can get into the argument of which Her Majesty. I could rattle off about eight right now. Right? So, yeah, we're not even going to get into what, which Her Majesty or, or what Her Majesty is or whether she's a servant or whether she isn't a servant. We're all servants of God. Every single one of us. Period. Beyond that, it doesn't matter. But that's the highest now, okay? Sorry, if I have to interject, I have to interject right now. Yep. We're all students of Earth. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Different philosophy on life, but so. it's the same thing, but okay. Uh, if I, I could actually expand on that then. If we're servants of God, um, that would automatically make us uh, students of the earth because when he went away and gave us dominion over the earth, he charged us with its care. Yeah, that's the so those are actually synonymous theories. Okay? Okay. So and that takes us to the highest form of law. I just talked about the lowest form of law, which is the servant class. And they've got everything flipped on us now. They, they've got us convinced in the public education system that government is, they're, they're the masters. Yeah. And we're the servants. And it's, it's completely the opposite way around. Well, you are a public servant. Like when you take the kid's school, it's... I wouldn't agree with that. But we won't get into that right now. So, so why are we in the mess that we're in? And it's, it's easy to see what happened is, and uh, we all know about the Catholic Church and the mystery schools and how they used to encode everything and uh, they would phrase things in different words to hide technology and theories and our rights and the whole nine yards. And, and it really struck me when I read a couple of books and uh, uh, one in particular uh, was it Ellen White, The Great Controversy. I read that and I read a couple other books on religion and I, everything for some reason came back to the whole, the Holy Trinity. And I've broached this topic before at some of our meetings. And that's where we start to get into trust law, which is what the Holy Trinity is. And that's why the Holy Trinity is so important, because trust law requires this three-party contract. That is trust law. Right? And that's what the Holy Trinity is. And the Catholic Church likes to call it what the, 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 the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Right? So we get the Father. We got the Son. Holy Ghost, back to the Father. So, it just uh, a couple of things hit me in the last couple of years. I was just sitting around, I was just reading parts of the Bible, and I got thinking about it, reading some definitions in Black's Law Dictionary. Kind of dorky like that. Saturday afternoon, I'll be sitting in my beach house, and I'll read a definition in Black's Law Dictionary just for fun, and I'll be like, oh, I don't know that word, so I'll look up that one. And then I'll find a word in that definition I don't know, so I'll look up that word, and I'll just spend six hours doing that. And I got through that, and I do the same thing in Bouvier's Law Dictionary. Yeah, nerd. <laughs> yeah, and it, this may even be common knowledge for a lot of people out there in the movement. I don't know if people really understand what it is, but, I mean, uh, the Bible is God, God's last will and testament. And people never really think about that, about what it is, about what a testament is. And if you look up the definition of the word testament, testament is something left by the testator in a will. Like your last will and testament. So you look at, oh, okay, well, last, last, you know, it's, it's, uh, um, 
the last testament of God or whatever, the, the God's testament. To, it's the last will and testament of God is what that turns out to be, where if you look in the Holy Trinity and you start to realize what we got here is trust law going on, is the Father, who is God, is the testator. And he's also the grantor. So he created man. He did his whatever seven days. Okay, I'm not going to get into what that actually means. It doesn't matter. It's all encoded. It's all riddles. He came along. He created the planets. He created us. Whatever you want to believe that means is up to you. It really doesn't matter. So he created us. Right? And he gave us dominion over the earth. So he made us the beneficiary. <laughs> Right? And what else would we have been? I, I call it the executor. Right? You don't want to be the trustee. Well, when you say dominion, this is uh, the same sense as yeah. they say dominion of Canada? Like, ah, you know what? Dominion of Canada. Doesn't matter. Over yeah, like Dominion of Canada. Yeah, it's, I mean, they used to have Dominion groceries. <coughs> Okay, same thing. Yeah, what's the, exactly, what's, what's in a word? What does it mean in that particular usage, right? So the Holy Ghost. Um, isn't it weird that it's actually called the Holy Ghost? It's a, it's, a, it's a ghost. It's something that doesn't really... It's a fiction. It doesn't really exist. So they probably changed in, in trust law. It doesn't exist. <laughs> no shit, eh? Yeah. Yeah, so we so we got this legal fiction over here, or uh, think about it, a ghost is form without substance. It's form without substance, right? But it's a, it it completes. Well, that's what a legal fiction is. Straight out. That's what a legal fiction is over here. So, um, trying to think of the proper word to explain that. So, um, I could explain that better. I'm not going to, because um, it's been a really long day, and I could get into that more. Uh, just uh, while we're on the topic of uh, what we're talking. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, safety break. Yeah. So these uh, the, so in trust law, you got the you got the three parties. And if you've ever read the trust handbook, you know that this isn't a very accurate diagram. In trust law, you've got the executor, you've got the beneficiary, and you've got the uh, trustee. The trustee is who holds all the property, right? The trustee is the slave. The trustee. Um, yeah, that's why they call it even a fiduciary trustee, right? And the, the trustee is who holds all the property in trust, and they have to obey the instructions of the executor for the benefit of the beneficiary, right? right? And that's where the trust law, and, uh, and this is getting into why we're having the problems we're having in the courts and the proof we've got of everything that's going on. This I'll explain better another time when I've had a chance to review what I had to go through months ago to come to that conclusion because it's not all coming to me right now. But either way, all is important, as you know damn well, just from the Bible, that the last testament of God is the last will and testament by the testator, he who created the trust, who left, who went away and left, and left us as the executors and beneficiaries of everything he left us. But it's all being held in trust by the trustees, right? And that's what makes the trust law complete, is the fact that the, tr the trustee cannot be the executor or the beneficiary, and a beneficiary or executor cannot be a trustee. Period. So what happens is when we're walking into court, and this is all stuff we can elaborate on later. I'm just kind of going through this real quick right now to bring everybody to have questions later. When we walk into court, what's happening, and I've heard every argument on the planet, people told me to walk into court and be the trustee. No, you got to walk into court and you got to be the trustee. The trustees hold all the power, right? Like, I mean, there's a million different theories out there, exactly, right? We all know government's the trustees. They're all public servants. They're all public trustees. Every single one of them. They're all the servants. They're the ones that hold all property for the benefit of the executors and the beneficiaries of all these estates. And I'll get into whatever you want about that later. A person, a trustee is a person with special privileges. Yeah. Well, you know, if you're heir, do they offer you correction as a benefit? Well... I could I could make a bunch of arguments on that as well, and I don't believe that at all. Um, because what happens is in court, if they've sent you to jail, 
it's because you were the trustee and you were being ordered to do something for the benefit of somebody else because you cannot be the trustee and the beneficiary. If you're ordered to go to jail, it's because somebody else is getting the benefit. So that's a lie that jail is a benefit. And the wall, no, this here is a because they're a service now. Correct, right? There you go. Uh, it's their offer you a service, you're getting a benefit. Yes, but you're not getting the benefit. Because you, you can't, because the trustees, only the trustees take orders. Crime college. Yeah, I know, eh? <laughs> Yeah, trustees, trustees take orders. We got confirmation of that today in court. It was a very, was a very simple process. Um, trustees take their orders from the executor. And it's for the benefit of the beneficiary. I've said that a few times now, but I'm kind of leading that into somewhere. Isn't that what they do in court? So what happens, um, they don't really switch. You've never corrected what's going on in the court. When you walked in, it was presumed you're the trustee. And when you went to jail, you went to jail as the trustee. And the whole time the judge was acting as the executor, because the executor is the one in power. The executor orders. So who is the beneficiary of the crown? Crown. Of course. Mm -hmm. And because you're the trustee, you can't be either of the other two positions. So here's how it's going. You've got, and I won't call them a judge. I had to correct them today, that justice. court. Yeah. I will call them a justice. And then you've got Dean over here, who shows up unwittingly um, answering to the name of the, uh, of the presumption of law that could be anything that turns out to be him when it's all done, because he consented to everything. He didn't rebut anything. So they fit this guy into the mold of the legal fiction. He tossed the, toss the hat on me, right? Which is the legal fiction. Which is, well, no. And then over here, you've got the crown. Right. So it's the public. Right. The, the, the justice and the crown are both government. In trust law, that's supposed to be a V, not GAT. <laughs> Let me just rewrite that real quick. They do have GATs. Gov. In trust law, you can be the trustee, sorry, uh, my bad. In, in trust law, you can be the executor or administrator. We'll call it both. Executor slash admin. When you walk into a courtroom, who's administrating everything? Who's telling everybody what to do? No, even though people have said, well, the clerk of the court really holds the power. I've heard all these different arguments. It really doesn't matter. The clerk of the court, sure, they follow the paperwork. Ultimately, they're the ones responsible for all this kind of stuff. I, could, I, I mean, I really could care less how the power structure within their system works. I'm going to tell you why things go the way they do in the courtroom, and I've proven this. Because the justice, because it's, they're presuming, they've made the presumption, and they're acting in the, uh, in the, under the presumption that the justice is the executor and the administrator of everything that's going on there. And the Crown is coming in as the beneficiary wanting a benefit. The Crown is saying, I want something. I want this guy to go to jail and I want to seize all the equity in some of his, uh, in some of his estate or whatever, right? Whatever you want to call it. Uh, sorry, I wrote benefit, but that's not right. He wants a benefit. Yeah, sure, we'll call it that, because he is, then he is claiming to be the beneficiary. In trust law, you can be both the executor or the administrator, which is the same thing, and the beneficiary. They can be the same party, and that turns out to be the government, because you don't rebut it. And you're left all alone over here. Because they're just filling an office and representing the government. You're sitting over here. And I can tell you right now, when the judge orders you to be taken into custody, if you don't go, you're going to be made to go by the sheriffs. And I'll tell you why. Because the trustees, when they're ordered to do something, they frickin' do it. Or you'll be made to do it. Because it's the job of the trustee 
to do to carry out the instructions of the administrator or the executor or you are in breach of trust that's a biggie and that is it that is the the biggie the biggie that's what's happening when you go to court people are making all these arguments i'm not a person i'm not this i'm not that i this definition says this and uh, blah, you know like i've heard it all i've heard it all i've even used some of them myself to find myself being hauled away under the orders of this guy right here right even hauled away before they even had that yeah even before that at that times yeah it all depends and it's all come back to this and this is the pro and this is what why when you walk in that's why there is a justice and there's you and there's a crown it's a three party system that's going on it's the holy trinity going on in court they're carrying out trust law in the courtroom and you don't know it and they're getting you to act as the trustee so that they can fill in both other positions one of authority and one of beneficiary which means they win on both counts whereas true public servants or public trustees because that's what they actually are they're even bonded and believe me they don't like being called public trustee if you want to if you want to bring sheriffs into the courtroom like that you call a justice a public trustee and there'll be four of them in there before you can blink what if you ask them if he's a public trustee um well i would start by calling him a public trustee you got to remember if the court operates in presumptions so can you then I'm going to operate in presumptions and I'm presuming that this guy appears as a public trustee because he's a public servant. That is an point. Yes. Absolutely. So excuse me, public servant. Um whoa, whoa! Sheriffs! Sheriffs get in here. We got work. Ah, right? Like that they they do that. It's an, it's insane. Yeah, I've seen it. Yeah, you're you're this close to contempt or I did literally I just actually just got handcuffed the one time. They didn't even say anything. They just handcuffed me, right? So you know you're doing something right when just saying two words make them lose their minds and why and this has happened with Marty Marty walked in to speak for a friend of ours as his representative and said well I'm the appointed administrator for Chris and before Marty could blink there was four sheriffs in that room and they had a sniper judge for him because they're expecting him because this is about the sixth hearing we've had and they just kept getting us come back down and railroading us in the whole 9 yards but not getting anywhere. They couldn't get anywhere with us. It was getting frustrating for them. Yeah. So they brought in the sniper judge. We know her name. We got it today actually and uh we filed complaints uh for her uttering threats in the courtroom and stuff like that and uh Marty's pretty much it's his mission in life now to take her down and remove her career from her. So we're going to have some fun with that. Yeah, cuz you got to remember yeah, exactly. Cuz you got to remember there's always recourse. Sorry. Yep. Uh, that's like this most recent thing uh Newspapers about this uh, judge in Kamloops saying that he's going to treat people that you know the law or free men differently. Yep. You know, if he identified himself as free men, he would have treated them differently. But because he said that he wasn't in line with yep. the World Free Men Society or whoever, the Free Men Association of Canada or whatever. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't mean to. Yeah, no, yeah, it's either way, but yeah, so the, the explanations to get to this point were fast, I didn't cover them properly, but the whole point was to get to this because I can just tell you this is this is the way it is. I'm I'm not even going to entertain ideas from anybody that's not the way it is. That's my opinion. But uh the whole little thing we went to takes you right to this. And now here's the problem when you start to switch up the roles and why they get so mad. And you got to remember this is in this is trust law. They can't violate this. This is the highest law there is because it's God's law. It's the Holy Ghost, it's the Trinity. Period. They can't get out of this. And the reason they hate this so much, as soon as you walk in, you got this justice and you got the crown and you got Dean over here. And now we walk in and we say, well, uh public trustee on the bench, let's just for shits and giggles say that they don't absolutely lose their mind and dump a load in the bench and call the sheriffs and they just go oh yeah yeah I'm a, I'm a public trustee okay well we just identified the trustee okay now who's the executor and the beneficiary nope you are you're both always uh, 
allowed it even versus the public? Always. Right, because of both the justice and the crown are public uh, trustees, and that leaves you as the only to be executor and beneficiary. We were left, man was given dominion over all the earth. We were left as the beneficiaries and the executors of the last will and testament of God. It's our birthright. Feel free to say that. Excuse me. I don't give a shit what name you're calling me. Ready? Well, no, no, no. Ready? Excuse me for living. Yeah. There we go. Yeah, you're right. I am Dean. And I'm the executor and the beneficiary of the last will and testament of God. Say that. You can say that. Just that. You can say that if you want. Just say, I'm the executor. put you in front of the mental health courts. Yeah, Andrew Swan's new mental health unit. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you, can just say, you can just say, well, excuse me, but uh, are, are you not a public servant? What are they going to say? Well, well, yes, I'm a public servant. Okay, then you're the trustee. Then you're the trustee. And here's why the crown can't be either of the other ones. Because they're both government. You cannot be the trustee and either one of these at the same time. And the government cannot be because they're, they're both government. They're both the same person. They're both agents of the government. They're both this. It doesn't. It, ultimately, they're the same person. Exactly. That's actually very yeah. good. A collection of persons can be eight. Persons. Because they're all acting as agents for a person. Yes. Right. Right. Whether or not it's it's a, it's like a, it's like an ant hill. Like there's all these millions of ants running around, right? But they just form one collective, mm -hmm. and the ant hill is is the living person, really, right? So the government's the person, and as soon as you've identified the trustee. And you know that you're the beneficiary. You know this guy cannot be either. And this guy can't be. So you have to be both. And they have to follow your instructions because you're the administrator and the beneficiary. Who's that? What is your standing here? Who are you? Get out of here. I'm administrating here. What's your claim? Well, at that point, you don't need to start getting into all the deconstructing their presumptions of law. You've done the big deconstruction. You've, established that you're standing You've removed the justice from your ability to, 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 to administrate the proceeding. Because the trustee is going to allow anything the Crown brings in because now the game's rigged. Because they're acting as both. And that's why you lose every time and you better do what the court order says at the end. And there's obviously ways around that because people skirt around the issues and they little wins here and little wins there and you know stuff like that. Like that, the guy in Ontario that went in, that uh, Keith or whatever his name is there, that walked in and yeah, and he did the right thing where he said, where he, I think he said, I'm the administrator of that account. Right? Yeah, and whether or not the judge bowed or whatnot, he didn't really finalize things properly, right? He didn't identify the judge as the trustee. He didn't, or, or even appoint the judge a trustee, right? So that, that, that's what you want to do is when you walk into court, because it's all operating on presumptions, and they, they've, they've rigged it, and they've named themselves as certain players in the court, and you haven't identified the players. So one of the last times I went in November, I just walked in, and I said, yeah, hi, uh, I said, I'm, reg I'm here regarding that matter when they called the name. They said, well, who are you? Who are you? I said, well, I, I was the man that was pulled over that night. I'm like, well, what's your name? I said, well, I said, actually, it actually really doesn't matter uh, but what names are here. I said, it's really more important what, what roles we're playing, isn't it? <laughs> What's your name? I said, well, I said, uh, I said for, for our purposes today, I said, you can call me beneficiary. Are you a public servant? I'm, I'm uh, you know, stuttering and then, uh, oh, is, is, this, is this that free man stuff? <laughs> I said, well, I said, it really doesn't matter what it is. I said, are you, are you not a public servant? Right? And she just ignored that. And she just went on to say something like, well, if you're, if you're, if you're, not, uh, if you're not the name we're calling, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to issue a warrant for, uh, for his arrest. And I wasn't going to get into it really with them. And I just basically said, I said, well, I said, I just told you I was the man that was there arrested that night. And you just told me you're going to issue a warrant for his arrest because he's not here. Thank you for making the judicial determination that I'm not the man you're looking for. Have a good day. Walked out. I'm going to issue a warrant for your arrest. Do whatever you want. I don't care. Walked out. 
Never heard about it again since. That's all that took. And I didn't, I didn't even know what my argument was going to be walked in that day. I knew I was going to raise the issue of beneficiaries and stuff like that, but as soon as she said, I'm going to issue a warrant for, 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 for the arrest of the, the accused, that's what it was. I just said, well, I just told you I was the man that was arrested that night and spent the weekend in jail. You just told me you're going to have an issue of warrant for the arrest of the accused because he's not here. So obviously, I'm not the accused. Thank you. Thank you for your legal determination. Have a good day. You guys sort whatever you want up. Left. That was for four traffic charges and obstruction of a peace officer. It took four minutes. Never heard about it ever again. And just as icing on the cake, uh, that was January 4th. I was charged November 25th. Uh, next week, I'm sending a little thank you to the court, uh, citing Section 786.2 of the Criminal Code of Canada, which says you've got six months to convict somebody in summary convictions from the date of arrest, or it's over. It's game over. It really doesn't matter, though. If they ever try to contact me again, I just get into this now, because now I just send letters to them, right, to Andrew Swan and stuff like that. Um, I can get into some of the stuff I've done that I'm probably... I'm never going to go to jail. They're just probably going to shoot me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, seriously, like some of the stuff I've sent off now. I just I I sent stuff to the Minister of Justice, uh, the, the the Minister of Finance. The one to the Minister of Finance, I actually told her. Uh, I said, like, you're not doing. You you failed in your job as a public uh, trustee. Uh, the fiduciary trustee that I appointed you as, you didn't provide lawful excuse as to why, blah, blah, for, regarding a matter. I just said, I'm, 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 I'm coming after you. I said, you've, bre you've breached, the tr you've breached uh, committed a breach of trust. I'm coming after you. I'm not going to stop. I'm the executive and the administrator. I ordered the trustee to do something. If she didn't jump, how come the sheriffs didn't walk all over them like they do in, in court, right? Well, I'm working on that. And I just literally said in the last line, Trevor, he thought that was the funniest thing he's ever read, where I just said, you are going to have to shoot me to make me stop. And Well, that was to Andrew Swan. <laughs> yeah, yeah. For, for the record, the Winnipeg City Police about seven years ago, when I first started getting involved in this kind of stuff, actually kicked in the door to my girlfriend's house and threatened to rape her looking for me. So that was Sergeant Hutter and Sergeant Young. If this goes online, congratulations, you're real men. Love you guys. 110-pound woman, woman at 2 o'clock in the morning in her night robe? Yeah, you guys, heroes. So that really stiffened my resolve, by the way, years ago, and now I don't care anymore. I don't care. I'll meet them head on. I'll meet them in court. I read you guys that letter that went out to the Crown Prosecutor earlier today. It said, there's not going to be a lawyer in court next time. It's going to be me. I'm going to be there in my full commercial liability as an executor and a vision beneficiary. I said, we're going to have a chat in front of the trustee. And I'm looking forward to it. I said, because you're going down. This is the letter that went out, basically what that said. And like that, that's the way, you, you got to let these guys know. I mean, if you walk into the court and you're like, um, uh, uh, I, I, I think I'm the, somebody told me online I'm the administrator, is that right? Okay, you're, you're getting bailed out in about a month. It's over at that point. That's what happened to Marty. The difference is, and uh, like we should get into some courtroom tactics stuff later on, I want everybody to understand the philosophy here, though, of what the biggest things going on here is. And that's the fact that once you figure out that the courtroom is just this holy trinity, and that the judge, justice, is trying to fill the role and be the player of the administrator or the executor, that automatically makes you the trustee by default. And then the crown, the basically who is the government. So the, the crown is, the reason the crown is a beneficiary is because the crown is the government. They're one and the same now, right? They're the same entity. So technically the government is both beneficiary and administrator. They're filling both roles. They're just having two different people play both roles in the courtroom. That's all that's going on, but they're one and the same party. That's why the deck is stacked. And then you're sitting over here as the, the, the trustee. doesn't matter what they're calling you. I don't care what they're calling you. You're filling the role of the trustee, but they're not telling you that. I don't give a shit if they call you George and your name is Bob. It is irrelevant. Of course, it kind of makes it seem a little stupid. Well, I, well, actually, my name is really Bob, so I don't mean that literally, right? It just it doesn't matter who you are at that point. If you're the trustee and you fill the role of the trustee, then you're going to be told what to do by this guy. And if you don't, 
In comes somebody who's not part of the Holy Trinity. He's called the sheriff because he's supposed to make sure that the trustee does their job. And that's why they're the highest authority on the land. You always hear from people, sheriffs are the highest authority on the land. Why? Because they're the ones that hold the trustee accountable if he doesn't do his job. What he's ordered to do. Yep. Can you get the sheriff to arrest the justice? Uh, I haven't done that yet. I planned on doing that in January in a city of Winnipeg uh, bylaw violations trial where I was actually... Yeah. <laughs> But I was going to go in and I was going to do that, but then I actually decided that I was going to go in and I was going to try a different tactic, and that was against Marcus Bukart, and I was going to be more honorable and just see where I could get just by dropping hints that I knew what was going on. And uh, City of Winnipeg, you can interrupt me anytime you want for the break, by the way, but the City of Winnipeg was coming after me for bylaw violations on my properties. Now, the problem was I, I, I know how to deal with that if it's my own personal properties, but the, the, the property was held by my, one of my numbered corporations for business. And so I went through the, well, shit, so it's a registered business. I was like, does that mean it's automatically under the jurisdiction? I'm, I'm hooped. I'm like, no, wait a minute. That's just a presumption. Just because I went down and, and filled out some articles of corporations, I'm the one that gave it substance. That doesn't bind me to anything. And I'm like, but I'm like, I still can't uh, go in and basically be the, like the executor and the beneficiary of a, of a, cor of a corporation. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, and I'm like, well, wait a minute. I'm like, what role would the judge want to fill? if the trial was against a corporation. You've got to remember, a, court, a courtroom will make itself whatever it needs to be for the, for the specific moment. So if it's a corporation before it, if, uh, if you wanted to be the head honcho of a corporation, who would you be? Well, no, actually, uh, we'll get into corporations and people, or private citizens, after the, after the break. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, after a safety break, yeah, well, uh, I'm just going to expand on a couple of things I, I, I covered before we took a little break there on, on the fact that the trust law is being carried out in the courtroom here. I, I'm going to touch a bit on these cl the claim of rights that everybody was big on for a long time uh, and, and why they're irrelevant, completely irrelevant. Uh, and then we're going to get on to some arrest roles here that has to do with the trust law as well, so we'll keep on kind of topic with that. But let's get on to people that want to use lawyers in a courtroom. And everybody believes that a lawyer, oh, you use a lawyer, you're contracting with a lawyer, then the, the lawyer is automatically contracting you. Yep. But even uh, getting a lawyer to get you out on bail after remand. Yeah. Um, he, he, any of these scenarios, right? Everybody's got a mistaken impression of what the lawyer is actually doing, right? Oh, they're all members of the Bar Association, they're all colluding. Well, that, that part's actually true. But what they're doing is not what everybody thinks they're doing. The lawyer is not contracting you with the court, right? Because they've got all the procedures and their bar association nonsense and the whole nine yards. But what's happening is because they're all colluding together and all members of the bar association, whether they know it or not, because they are trained, lawyers are trained, your lawyer is trained that they have to obey the master. They're called the master in court. They bow to the guy, okay? Who do you bow to? Your master. Your, your master. The, 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 if you walk in somewhere and, and, and people are bowing to somebody, they're bowing to the guy with the most authority in the room. And who's got the most authority in the room? You. Well, technically we do. But what are they operating on? They're operating on the presumption that the judge is the executor and administrator. Because they're bowing to him. He's the top guy. So that's what your lawyer is allowing. Your, your lawyer is not contesting the fact that you're actually the administrator and the beneficiary. The lawyer is allowing the court to continue on the premise that this guy is the executor and this guy is the beneficiary, which are one and the same anyways. So your lawyer is allowing the court to operate on the presumption that the government is the executor and beneficiary and that you are the trustee. And the lawyer has got no problem doing that, selling you down the river, because he's not the one that's liable. He's making money. You are. That's right. You're the trustee. You're the one that goes to jail when his master orders it, not him. And that's why they're limited liability. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm limited liability. Uh, you want to go after the full line limited liability guy, the guy that's actually going to take the fall here. Go after, go after this guy. 
So that's what is going on with the lawyers. That's why you... I've heard the argument, okay, well, I went to court with a lawyer. We won kind of stuff, okay? Like you're one of the 3% of uh, people that actually went in court with a lawyer even trying to make... Well, I, I made my lawyer put that affidavit in the file and, you, you know, blah, 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 blah. Like that's all irrelevant. I'm just going to tell you what's actually going on in the courtroom, and that is that your lawyer, because they're all members of the Bar Association, he does not have your best interests at heart. He's not, he has no oath to you to your best interest because his oath to the law society supersedes that oath, which is a conflict of interest, and which actually kind of, uh, that's your remedy down the road, by the way, if you ever want to go back and say, well, this guy didn't tell me he had a superseding oath, which means that what he allowed to go on in that trial was not, was not consensual. There's no contract, right? And that's, that's a big thing. We could have an entire episode just on no contracts. <laughs> And that's a fun one. They don't like that. Um, so that's what your lawyer is actually allowing. Your lawyer is allowing the proceeding to continue on, on the presumption. But wait, that is consent. If you consent to a lawyer, that is consent to the overall proceeding. But he didn't get full disclosure. No full disclosure. He didn't tell you he has a superseding oath. Right. 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 That's wrong. They didn't disclose. That's what should I, what's actually going on here. Yeah. So you you were you were hoodwinked. Can you, be, can you be bound to a contract where you were hoodwinked? Can I sell you a car with, with no engine if I, yeah. Yeah, I know. Yes, yeah, so you got remedy. There, there's never too late to go back, right? And that, that's the, the, one of the great things too. But, uh, so that's what's going on when you hire a lawyer. It's not he's contracting me with the court. Uh, he's binding me to third party arbitration and this and that, the whole nine yards. No, what he's doing is he's not contesting the fact that this guy is not actually the executive and administrator. That's all that's going on. He's allowing it to continue on this premise that you're the trustee, you're going to pay fines when ordered, you're going to go to jail when ordered for the benefit of the government at the instruction of the government. What? Okay, and this here is also the same as uh, if you first time come out and actually say something in writing to, let's say, uh, the DMV. Yep. Uh, like you, you never had... Uh, full disclosure to the contract. Yep. You know, like they, they say that they're offering a license, but it's also insurance. You were never shown the full insurance. Okay. Well, you were never shown the condition of insurance. And when did you ever? We that? yeah, we spoke about this before we were rolling on the cameras. Something else we can talk about another day, even uh, about the fact that it's impossible for it to be a contract between you and government. It's absolutely impossible. We can get into that to another meeting. We've talked about uh, the people I did talk to here real quick about that. Everybody knows now why, and yes, it's true, it's impossible for you to have a binding contract with the government. Uh, how many lawyers in your estimation actually know that they're perpetuating this little fraud? I like to talk with them about this down at the courts. I'm there frequently. I was there for seven hours again today. Uh, I really don't, I've got to spend more time on my actual career that pays the bills because <laughs> yeah. I spend a lot of time with this one. But uh, they smile a lot. And then suddenly a lot of them don't want to talk to you anymore. They go silent, they Right. Um, so a lot of them know. Uh, if they don't know, they suspect. they suspect or they have, you know, like a, a vague comprehension of what's really going on. Judges know, or they're just robots. Most judges know. I think there's no question about that because the, ju the judges are all, sorry, all picked from lawyers that they know are very aware of what's going on, are comfortable with the idea that they're screwing people and have no problem committing this fraud against people. And actually, I don't even like to use that word. It's not fraud. There's no such thing as fraud because you're not contesting it. Yeah. Right? So I've heard people say, well, that's fraud, or, uh, you know, people have been charged with defrauding okay. court. And lie, uh, cops can lie to obtain consent. Yes. It's not fraud. It's not fraud if you don't know your rights. That's not fraud. Yeah. Right? I don't even like that word. I tried to... Yeah, I... I, yeah, I, I there you go. I try not to use that word even. I let it slip out there. So, uh, yeah, I was kind of saying it in quotes. Yeah. <laughs> it's like the word, uh, you know, uh, people, you've, you've defrauded this court or something like that, right? And it's like, I've defrauded this court, so I've done the opposite of fraud? Isn't that good? I've removed the fraud from the court. Oh, right? Yeah. And then, and then you get some of that again, right? That's, you always know when you're right. Because they freak out, right? That's when they lose their minds. Otherwise, they're very calm. They're always like, Sheriff, take this man away, right? He's calm because he knows you don't have a clue and you're screwed. As soon as there's yelling 
and they're freaking out, well, you're, you're on the right path. Because that's when they start getting belligerent. And that's one of the clues that you know that they don't have, uh, know what to do next. Uh, oh, they, they know what to do, believe me. They'll, uh, a lot of times if, if, like I say, like we have one friend that Marty's been going to court with a couple times now, about five times in a row before they finally brought in their sniper judge that every argument Marty brought up and he wasn't really uh, as prepared as he should have been. And as soon as the sheriff came, he did, he did the old, oh, I'm not going to jail for this and sat down kind of thing, right? So, yeah, whereas um, I told everybody here the story about uh, I sent a first-time guy, my, my older brother, he knows a little bit about this, but not much. I sent him into family court for the first time of his life in Alberta. First hearing, we filed an affidavit and a motion for uh, motion to quash in the court. He went down, filed it in the court at 8.30 in the morning. The court was at 2.30 in the afternoon. Went up to the courtroom, had copies for the Crown. Gave, uh, they actually used crowns there, I think. It was the weirdest thing for family court. Uh, or no, maybe it was a private lawyer, I can't remember either way. So he served, gave it the lawyer, gave, walked up to the clerk of the court, asked her, he goes, did you guys receive my affidavit earlier today? And she's like, huh, are, are, are you this guy? He's like, yeah, it's me. Oh, oh yes, we got it. He's like, oh, okay, that's kind of weird. So he goes and he sits down, the judge came in, and uh, he basically sat, he just stood up and, and said, I'm here regarding that matter. That was it. And she, Mr. Clifford, blah, 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 blah. He didn't address the name at all. That's why the name game is absolutely irrelevant. I can prove it. I know it because it happened with my brother. Didn't even address the name. Just said, I'm here regarding that matter. Your name that you've put, labeled me with, I don't care. I'm here regarding that matter. Mr. Clifford, blah, 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 Five minutes later, right? And she just looks at him. She's like, how do you wish to proceed? He goes, did you read my affidavit? Well, yes, I read your affidavit, Mr. Clifford. And she's been kind of nice to him, right? And he's like, well... Motion to quash. Mr. Clifford! Three minutes later, and she knew he was, she was just trying to draw him into an argument that was irrelevant. He knows that, because unfortunately, I hate to admit it, he's kind of smart like that sometimes, and I've taught him well. So, after about two and a half minutes of that, she's like, how do you want to proceed? Excuse me, did you read my affidavit? Yes, Mr. Clifford, I read your affidavit. Motion to quash. Mr. Clifford, there's children at stake here. Four minutes later, he had to interrupt her. He finally said, excuse me. Did you or did you not read my affidavit? Yes, Mr. Clifford, I read your affidavit. Motion to quash. Next thing he knows, there's two sheriffs coming up on each side of him. Right? He just looks side to side. And Darren's a big guy. He's about... 210, 220, I, I think. He's my height, maybe about an inch taller, and he's just, he looks like Razor Ramon from WWF Wrestling, you know, like the toothpick kind of guy, like, eh, you know, like I'll take you down kind of stuff. And he looks to the side of him, and there's these two sheriffs. They had this thing scripted. They had this thing scripted. They had a guy with an earpiece in the corner waiting for the appropriate time to call the sheriffs in. They were waiting for him. They had it all ready to go. They had the two sheriffs there for intimidation. They just slipped in uncalled. Now he just let, I, I thank God I told him to prepare for that. I said, be prepared for sheriffs. When they walk in, this is what you do. He said, excuse me, are these two gentlemen public servants? And right away, her head just went down. And he said there was an awkward silence for about a minute. And even he was like, this is just getting awkward. So, yeah, so, so, yeah, so finally he just goes, well, he goes, it appears they are public servants. So on and for the record, they do not have my consent to touch me. They don't have my consent to intimidate me. I want them to back away from me right now. And they just scurried off to the corner a little bit. And she just looks in. He said she just basically looked up. And she just went, how do you want to proceed? He goes, I think my business is done here. They turned around to walk out. She goes, Mr. Clifford, I can file a something, something, something in your absence. And he turned around and he just went. <laughs> and kept walking out. And he said, just the look on these two sheriff's faces. When he walked by the one guy who was a half a foot taller than him, the guy was going, looking at the judge. Like, tell me to do something. Right? He, what arguments did he make? Did you read my affidavit? Motion to quash. That was it. The rest was in the affidavit. He didn't have to say a thing in court. That was it. It was about preparation. That's something else we can get to another time. 
right? First time guy, never been in any of these situations before in his life. He never heard about it ever again. They've never contacted him. They never answered the motion. Isn't that kind of weird? Three times motion to quash. They didn't grant or deny the motion. Just the threats. I can issue a, a, a warrant for your arrest in your absence. <laughs> yeah, I care. And walked out. That was it. No more summons, no more, no more letters, no more nothing. That was the end of it. And that's all he had to do, right? So I can't remember why we've gotten that topic, but that's okay. But that's just how easy this kind of stuff is. So, um, but what he did was he didn't allow the judge the position of authority. I think is what's going on. They couldn't jockey him in a position. Uh, it was even a preliminary hearing where they're trying to set up the players. And I don't think they even got around to that. That's kind of my thinking on that. They didn't even get around to setting up the players of what was going on. He kind of just took control of the situation. just kind of said, well, do you read my affidavit? Motion to quash? No? Okay. Well, see you later. Bye. When he was leaving, would it have been better if he just turned and said, you don't have my consent for that? And walked out? No. I think what he did was better. Oh, okay. Because it's more... Uh, well, the question is authority. Yeah, it, it is more like... <laughs> Who are, who are you? I, I don't give a sh I don't give a shit what go ahead. I don't care what you do. Servant, masters, like do whatever you want, please. It's like a little kid. Yeah. Did you have anything else to say about what you were just talking about this case or whatever that Oh not about that one, but uh, just real quick, can we talk about the lawyer stuff? So that's gone. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, well, we'll just we'll briefly cover. We'll do it more in a couple of minutes, but we'll do arrest rolls and claim of right real quick. So we can do whatever. Yeah. So, because this is uh, the side of the road, a lot of people have a problem with the side of the road, and they think they got to do the old uh, excuse me, uh, uh, peace officer. Uh, did you observe me breach the peace? You know, yada yada yada. Actually, what I say. There you go. The whole nine yards. The problem is, if you call them a peace officer, uh, they've got peace officers defined in every different act in different roles. So they can be a peace officer under the Highway Traffic Act. So are you a peace officer? Yes, I am. He's not going to tell you he's only a peace officer under the Highway Traffic Act in that instance. Right? Well, so you're sunk. I in lawful definitions. So well, yeah. Under a different definition. Yeah, that's the whole thing. You got to, if you guys are going to be do, you, if you guys are going to be doing business side of the road, you got to identify the players right away, right? Yeah. Yep. So so why is it the judge has, or sorry, not the judge, why is it the police officer has the authority to stop you, question you, and then write up an order and carry it out on the spot? Presumption. Presumption, yes. But why does he have that authority? How can he possibly have that authority? Because we grant him to him. We just, we just covered this. Because he's the executive. He's acting as... He's, he's acting as administrator and beneficiary of the trust on the spot. And you're the trustee, and you're not doing what he told you to do. Right on the side of the road. So you got a cop that pulls you over, and that's the arrest rules right here, because people wanted to talk about that when we got back, the arrest rules, and you get pulled over. And people are, uh, I even did that one time, excuse me, are you a peace officer? And the guy's like, yeah, I'm a peace officer. I'm like, all right, well, what, what's your claim against me? He's like, I don't need a claim against you. And I was like, well, I, blah, 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 and I got kind of mad about that, right? And then the guy, but he was right. He was absolutely right. He's the executor. He's acting as the executor, and I didn't remove that from him, right? Uh, that's, uh, where, uh, I got a friend that uh, calls that uh, stripping titles. And they understand this? Yes, they know this. Okay, they absolutely, and this I... This is I, a whole new lesson, though. This is a whole new lesson, so we'll get into that another time. But that's basically what's happening at the side of the road. At the side of the road is, yeah, you've heard people, yeah, you, yeah, you've heard people say it before. So we can further explain that um, about you're holding court at the side of the road. People used to tell me that five years ago. And I'm like, what are you talking about? You're not holding court at the side of the road, right? Well, in trust law, you are, because court is any administrative proceeding where the three parties are present, and they are. Because he's two of them, and you're the trustee. That makes your next appointment the court. Well, then they just railroad you through from there. They just they just continue on with the presumption from there. They make it more formal. They add more players, right? And that's an excellent other side. Yeah. So we'll, we'll get into that another time. But what you would do in that situation, because uh, then then it gets to be fun. <laughs> so we can get arrest rolls gone. Uh, Clear right. Yeah. 
See, uh, actually, this is something that I would like to say. Do you mind if I say No, nope, how about it? Okay. I am Patrick. I'm uh, the current Chief Administrative Officer of uh, the Canadian Chapter of the World for the Society. I know that it's a uh, mouthful to say, but uh, the claim of right is uh, one of the big uh, spots that people uh, stumble at because the claim of right can be uh, applied to anything. It's not just a uh, demand for free hydro or demand for whatever. It's, uh, it's hey, this here is my life. You know, you got something coming into a lot of my life. Yep. This is what I live. Anyways, uh, but the claim of right itself can be applied to any situation. It's a procedure. It's not just a solution. So you've got to open up negotiations. You've got to say, hey, this is what I believe. Do you believe something else? And you know you don't. And these are things that can be entered into a legal proceedings. If you want to take this commercial, uh, what's the power to contract? Yes. Yep. So that's all I want to say. Okay. It's, thing, right? it's really confusing for something. It is. So, the premise of the claim of right, for people who don't know what that is, is that people have written up 100-page documents where they've gone through and they've decided, I want to let the government know all the rights that I have. I want them to let them know that if I want to walk out in my yard and cut my grass to 1.5 inches, I can do that. And they think that they've got to write these giant, thick documents up. Oh, man, if I don't get that one in there, I don't have the right to do that either, right? Okay, the problem with that is, why don't we turn that around? If you want to do a claim of right, the claim of right you should be sending to the government should be one line long. Okay, but wait, 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 wait. Okay, wait. well, hang on. The, the claim of right is also a legal defense. It, well, it can, it can be, but I'll get into what would be a better legal defense than the claim of right. The claim, the claim of right you should be sending to the government is, is one line long. Uh, provide proof of claim for something that you're alleging I cannot do. Perfect. Um, <laughs> <laughs> cannot fly. Yeah, we came up with that. I got, I got looking at these documents. I'm like, oh my God, like this guy's got his right to shave his beard after two days on this document. Like, they're not saying we don't have these rights. No one's ever said we don't have these rights. That's not what the problem in court is. It's not that we don't have rights. And if you want to establish your rights for what, if you think that you need that, that needs to be necessary, then the only argument you need to make as government is I'm going to give you 21 days to send proof that I'm not allowed to do something. <laughs> guess what? If they don't send you a reply, then I guess other than not harming somebody, you can do what we already know. Anything you want. That alleviates the need for all that nonsense. So we just turned that right around to them. And then I decided after that, I'm like, well, instead of even sending that, so let's just go a couple steps further with that. We can get into that in another thing altogether, but, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to yeah. No, no, it's all good. But so instead of the claim of right, you can narrow down what a, what a claim of right is. And I've talked with, this, with, with a number of people here. And that's basically that the, I think the fee schedule was the most important part of the claim of right. Now, that's not a claim of right. That's a contract offer, right? Now, the, the theory on this, and it's completely correct, is that your rights have a price attached to them, whatever you think that they are. So you can consider, and I like to use the car lot approach on this one because it helps people understand how to negotiate with the government. It's not even negotiation. I, I don't even use that word anymore. It's not a negotiation, right? Your offers are non-negotiable, and this is why. Your rights have a price attached to it because only you can determine what they're, what they're worth. So you have a car lot. You're a car salesman. Here's your little car building lot, right? Building right here is your office. Office, okay. That's yeah, yeah, it's whatever, okay. And here's your your compound, right? And this compound encompasses what is your life and your rights and what you what you're able to do, what God left you as your 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 estate, right? And everything's in here. Um, doesn't matter what it is. Every right is like a car. So you got all these little cars over here. I don't care if they're Pintos. I don't care if they're the most. I don't care if it's your right to shave. This one is my right to wake up in the morning. I don't care what it is. 
you send them a fee schedule to let them know that violating any of your rights is worth, okay, what, $1 million? $1 million. Okay? Now you got, I don't, so all your rights could fill this car lot if, you, if it's your, your rights are imaginary car lot. So what you're saying to the government is um, you're not negotiating at all. You want the government to know that when they come onto your car lot and they purchase a car, your price is clearly listed on the windshield and it's a million dollars and it's non-negotiable. At that point, it's their choice if they want to buy the car or not. And if they want to buy the car and kick your teeth in, then they're going to pay your price. And it's their choice at that point, and that's contract law. Because you've given them notice in advance that that is what your rights are. And if you don't like my prices, then don't buy cars from me. And that should be your attitude with the government. If you don't want to have to pay $11 billion, I don't care what it is, make it something ridiculous. I really don't care, right? Because we'll get into how you can enforce that. And it's been done. Yeah. Um, once they know it's their choice to violate your rights, to buy that car that's worth that money, and that's contract law, and that's notice, you don't need to negotiate that. You can. But why would you? you? Of course you can send the government a notice and say, well, I think my rights are worth a million dollars a piece. What do you think they're worth? But why would you? Right? It's your car lot. It's your cars for sale. And it's your price. And they've got the option of coming on to your property, which is your rights, trespassing on your, law, on your, your compound, and buying a car that's overpriced. And this is all just because it involves you. Like you are the it's your rules. Your you rule your domain. You, 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 you. Your rights, your body, your they're yours. And they're worth what you say they're worth. And you have the right to do anything you want as so long as you cause no harm. The claim of right is unnecessary. It's unnecessary because if you want to establish what your rights are, you do what I tell you to do and you, t you send them a notice saying, you've got 21 days to tell me what, uh, send me a, a, a fact. Send me some facts, some evidence of what you're claiming I cannot do. Let's start there. But we're not trying to think that way anymore because of the public schools. I can totally get that. Yes. I right. If they don't reply, then I guess other than doing no harm, you can do anything you want. Are they going to send you a notice back that says, yeah, you're obligated to obey all these statutes? You think they're going to actually respond to that? No. They're not going to, well, yeah, you need a license to drive. They're not going to reply. Believe me, I've got a file cabinet full of legal letters that they have not replied to ever, and they never will. Because they know that I know who I am. I'm the executor and the beneficiary of my estate. And that's what it boils down to. And I'm going to tell the trustee what I think my shit's worth. Pardon my French, I'm a contractor. The right? very first step is taking accountability for your actions. Ah, that's a whole other lesson in itself is assuming liability, right? <laughs> Just a teaser on that. Everybody is scared of this whole liability thing. Oh, my God, I'm not assuming liability. That means I'll have to, like, pay, right? No, 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 no. That's what we've been trained. Again, that's the whole the brainwashing thing, right? He who assigns the liability is in the seat of power because you're the one that's liable. So you're the one that dictates because it's on you. You're the one liable, which means you're telling everybody else what to do, right? So because government has trained everybody to, oh, yeah, hey, hey, we'll step in and we'll assume liability for everybody. So when you're out there driving on the roads, you get an accident, hell, we'll just buy you a new car. We'll pay for the hospital bills. We'll do everything. We'll assume all liability. Just contract with us. And why? Because when they assume all liability, they control because they're the ones that are assuming the risk. And we can get into that on another so one. They the terms. So they dictate the terms. So you want to dictate the terms. They're a limited liability corporation. What are they compared to you? A full liability man. Right? Yeah. And that's, that's, uh, that's the one I've told you guys before about. We've, we, we've used the poker game uh, analogy. 
for what that's all about. For the poker game, right? We're playing Texas Hold'em. And when I go all in with one of my claims, which is an affidavit, I'm going all in with full commercial liability. This guy over here has half the chips. He's limited liability. He can't swear out an affidavit. He's a corporation. doesn't really exist. He's limited liability. He's, he, can't, he can't match what I put in. I win by default. Plain and simple. That's how that works. They can never match us. Ever. And that's why it's okay to just to walk in and say, yeah, I'm that name. I'm full liability. I'm a man. All my rights are intact. And uh, I'm the heir and executor of these proceedings. What's going on? So it's not about the name, it's who you are, the player you are in that game. Your name's irrelevant. But they want you to think it's all about the name. That's probably why half that disinformation is out there. Yeah. Absolutely. And a lot of yep. So uh, people are playing hockey, and there's all these players out there, and they all got uh, they all got names on their jerseys. What's important? The name on the jersey, or what position they're playing? The number. Yeah. But the, their position. What player are they? Are you center? Are you defense? You know what are you? Oh, he's uh, he's he's John. Well, what does that tell me? That doesn't tell me anything. What actual function does he carry out on that hockey arena? Think of this uh, when you're on board yeah. ship. John doesn't carry me. John doesn't tell me anything. Yeah, there you go, Captain. Well, who's that guy? That's Fred. Well, who the hell's Fred? Well, he's the captain. Oh, oh, that's who he is. Well, I don't even care if his name's Fred. I just wanted to know that he was the captain. Because now I know what role he's playing. And that sets the stage for your conduct with that individual. Not his name, the role he's playing. That's very important, fundamental. Oh, absolutely. And who's doing that in court? Nobody. They're walking in and saying, I'm not that name, I'm this name. And they're saying, I don't give a shit what name you are. Because you're the trustee. So that's like a straw man argument they use against you. Yeah. Pretty much. And that's why people are losing every day using those arguments and going to jail. Because the name is irrelevant. They want you to think it's about the name. Because ultimately, your name is man. Beyond that, it doesn't matter. And if you're a man, you are the beneficiary and executor. Plain and simple. That's one heck of a lesson. Yeah, that's good, man. Right there. That's, that's just the beginning. Yeah, maybe we'll end this. So we'll end it there. Uh, <laughs> That's many, exactly what you're saying. yeah, many more to come. Uh, hopefully, like I say, that was uh, once people kind of wrap their head around that and they see the truth of it, um, the the possibilities from there just just they just explode in your mind, and you start to realize who you actually are. You've probably heard people talk about that before. Once you understand who you are, blah blah blah, but then they go off on an, a, a straw man argument. Right, that didn't make sense to me. Right. Who you are? Yeah. That yeah. You got to know what role you're here to play. Yeah. yeah. That's what's important. Yeah. Does it matter what you call the, the the king chess piece on the board? Oh, I named that one Frank. Oh. Well, what does Frank do? Well, he's the king. Oh. Well, so you're this way. Uh, well, that changes things. <laughs> it's like that Humpty Dumpty quote. It's like all that matters is who is master and who is servant. That's the roles. Figure out who the roles are. I said that in court on, I think, January 4th when I was in, where I said, well, I said, excuse me, I said, clerk, I'm just trying to figure out what roles everybody's playing here. I said, and I know I'm the beneficiary. I said, who did you appoint the trustee? And she just went. You're not supposed to know that. And there was about a minute of that. I was like, I was like, okay. I said, apparently you're not going to tell me who the trust is, trustee is, so I'm just going to assume it's that guy. Oh, is this that free man stuff? You know, blah, blah, you know, they started that kind of thing. I just said, well, I don't, I'm not here to even make that argument. I'm not going to talk to you, though. Yeah. And that's exactly what you're going to say. And even if you are picked down as, uh, like, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what should we call it? Uh, what should we call it? The Spreeman philosophy or the Spreeman group or the Spreeman association or whatever? 
Uh, and we're all like spiritual beings. Like we all uh, discover our own lessons on our own or whatever. Yeah. You don't have to identify with it. And if some judge is going to come down on you because you identify with these uh, free man philosophies, or that's an attempt. That's an attempt to, to, to humiliate you and ridicule you, yeah. to make it's your it's yeah, it, it, to, to make your argument seem like oh, you're one of those guys, you know, it's like. Statutes, what do I care? That's public servant yeah. codes. That's irrelevant. That's for trustees to follow. Yeah. I'm not a trustee, so I could care less what their what the the, the, the criminal code yeah. of Canada Actually, says. That's something else that we could get on to in another uh, another time, yeah. Installment is uh, the role of enforcement officers as to whether or not they can be witnesses. Yes. Because they're supposed to be neutral in the whole scheme. Yeah, they serve a different capacity. So we haven't really we haven't really even fully explored that one yet. Yeah, but yeah, but talking to sheriffs, I'm in the courthouse quite a bit, believe me. Um, and I just talk. I just like to walk up to sheriffs. And I'm like, so how do you like being a sheriff? You know, and they'll be like, oh, you know, it's pretty good. And they go, we don't get to carry guns. And I'm like, yeah, but law's not really about who carries the biggest gun, is it? And they're like, no, it's not. And they smile. And they know, eh? And I'm like, because you guys are the highest authority on the land, right? And I say, do cops even know that? And they're like, no, I don't think they know that. I said, it sucks you guys are, are, are paid less than them because, uh, you know, considering you guys are the highest authority in the land, you should be paid more than anybody because you've got more jurisdiction than them. And they smile. They know exactly. They know exactly. They're taught all about human rights and this stuff. They know. It's, yeah. And, they're, and a lot of them are nice guys. Yeah. Exactly. We just don't. Okay, so I guess, I don't know, if, even if people are still rolling, that sums up the first one here. And uh, like I say, every meeting hopefully will continue to bring people up to speed more and more on what we're doing. Uh, I'm hoping to be back for next Tuesday. Uh, and I'd like